Hi, I'm Merrick Damon, and welcome to The Merrick Damon Show. You know, the goal of this show, and this episode in particular, is to bring together the best knowledge there is in the world in our business. I've gathered the nation's leading experts, and I want them to discuss their keys to success, how to overcome obstacles, and more importantly, how to keep it moving, just like my book. So today's guest is Chris Keynes. Hey, Chris. Hey, how's it going, Mick? I'm so happy you're here. I'm happy to be here. So, Chris, I want the audience to know a little bit about you. You know, I know you. You're my friend. You do amazing work. So can you just tell them about some of the great things or what you do in Miami? Absolutely. Um, so my name is Chris Keynes. I'm the executive director of the Miami Urban Future Initiative at Florida International University. Um, we're a nonprofit think tank looking at the future of Miami's economy. Uh, we provide data-driven research on sure. the different trends that are happening in our community, whether they're talent or transportation or housing or um, lots of different things that have either economic in nature or tangentially economic. Sure. Um, doing a lot of work around the future of Miami's economy. All right, let me get the first question out because I know the audience and I know you guys out there really want to know this question. How is Miami's economy, and this is important, affected by climate change? And what is it doing to us? Sure, absolutely. So when we think about resiliency, there's a lot of different kinds of resiliency, right? There's, there's the actual water that's going to come up from the water table and, and sea level rise. Um, but then there's also the impacts of that before the water comes, so whether that's insurance rates rising, um, being harder to get mortgages. We do see sea level rise and, and climate change playing a substantial role uh, sure. going forward. Um, but, but more than that, we also see um, our elected officials needing to take action on something that's happening a little bit beyond perhaps their actual term of office. It's really hard to get people excited and thinking about something that might not be affecting them today uh, when their election is tomorrow. You know, I have a problem because people are always asking me, the real estate guy, right? You know, what do I do in real estate in Miami? It's so nervous. I don't know if my insurance is going to rise. I don't know what the what's happening with the climate change, if the water level is rising. And I have to try and calm them down and try and also put away some of their fears are you addressing that at all? It, part of your research, is it to calm down the public and help people understand that there is change and it, it can happen? So it's a little bit of both, right? So we're trying to inform people. We are sure. not here to be cheerleaders and talk about, you know, a paint rose-colored glasses over what are really some challenges that are, that are facing our region. Um, we're also not fatalistic about the future of Miami. We're somewhere in between. Um, I joke that every time we release a, a new report, we want about half the people to say we're being too positive and about half the people to say we're being too negative and that we know we've kind of hit the sweet spot um, right. in terms of being able to tell some, some hard truths. Um, but it, it is really hard, especially around challenges that um, feel really big. So a lot of what we do is we focus on just giving the facts to people and then letting them decide with the facts what they, you know, who they want to vote for, who they want to support, what kind of policies they want to advocate for them and their communities. Well, that jumps right into my next question about the future. And you're all about the future. And for you people out there watching and listening and thinking, oh, well, I've seen that map of Miami <laughs> or Florida and I've seen the water rising. There's a really big future in Miami, but I want to talk about your future and your past. How'd you end up in Miami? Tell me about how did it become your future? Yeah, so it's, it's really random. So I, I cold applied. I'd never been to Florida. I'd never been to Miami before. I cold applied to a job at the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Sure. Um, I got it and uh, started my career here. I worked my way up in the foundation, ultimately becoming the interim program director sure. um, there uh, for the Miami market. Uh, we had about a $28 million portfolio looking at um, innovation, entrepreneurship investments in the greater Miami area. Uh, and then from there, I spun out into uh, an initiative that I'm now leading at the University of Florida International University, um, looking at the future of our economy. Right. And so, it's, and, it's you know, I, you're doing a wonderful job. You know, you were awarded one of the influencers in 2018 by the Miami Herald for people in Miami. That's a really good like thing. Yeah. How, were you surprised? So it was extremely validating, right? So right. it was the, the 2018 Miami Herald Influencers that chose 50 people across the state um, who had some kind of policy expertise um, and uh, kind of allowed us to do a series of op-eds and um, different policy briefings for elected officials and other folks who are doing work around the state uh, and issues that are important to our future. It was great. I looked to my right and it was like the Archbishop of Miami. To the left is like Emilio Estefan and then like, I'm just like this random kid. That <laughs> it just ends right, up in Florida, right? What we're we're going to do right here. Oh, awesome. You are from California. I am. You went to school in the Northeast. How do you feel about Miami? What do you think about, what are some of the things that you can tell the audience about, you know, about Miami and why they should want to come here? So Miami is a really special place um, in the sense that we are the city of the future. And 
this is kind of my selling point when I talk about the work that we do at the initiative, but also just why Miami is an important city. Sure. When you think about demographic change, urban mobility challenges, affordability challenges in general, sea level rise, we're on the forefront for a lot of the challenges sure. that the rest of the country are going to be facing someday. Sure. Um, and so being part of the solutions and being part of the things and finding out what works and what doesn't work um, for, for our community is actually really interesting. I don't know if we'll be able to solve everything, sure. but the things that we do solve here become scalable solutions to be used in other cities as they continue to kind of deal with some of these and grapple with some of these challenges that we are already facing today. Wow, and then we can teach others Absolutely. about what we've done. Um, let's talk about maybe let's, let's one of those topics, affordable housing. You know, I'm in the real estate business and, you know, one of the things that happens in Miami for people that want to visit and want to find a, their beautiful home here, they think, wow, it's pretty expensive. It's not really one of those places where you can come with an average job and just find a, the home of your dreams. Are we addressing that issue at all or is there anything that you guys are focusing on that really addresses it? It's a really important question, a really important topic, especially for our region's economic future. Um, and I, I promise not to get too wonky with the data, but I just want to share one statistic with you. Sure, go ahead. Um, so in Greater Miami, so this is Miami, Broward, and Palm Beach counties, 62% right. of renters are cost burden. So that means they're spending at least 30% of their income on rent. Wow. Um, that is the highest rate in the country. Now, our housing in absolute dollars is not as expensive as a D.C. or a San Francisco or a New York, but it's high. Sure. And then our wages are so proportionally low uh, that that's kind of a double whammy effect, right? So you have the, the high housing and the low wages, and it results in people having to spend a large percentage of their income on housing. The median renter is spending 43% of their income on, 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 on rent. It's just not sustainable for our economy in the long term. So sure. we need to find innovative solutions to some of this housing affordability. Some of it is going to come from the private sector and developers understanding the, the unique challenges. Um, but then we also need our public sector leadership as well, whether it's income tax credits or vacancy taxes. Like Finding ways uh, to incentivize affordable housing development is really important, and workforce as well as affordable. Well, it's great to know that you guys are all working on these projects. So this is really wonderful. And working with developers and builders alike to help them get you know a foothold in this market and to keep clients and potential buyers aware. Um, transportation is another issue that we're addressing in South Florida. Um, anybody knows has visited Miami, Fort Lauderdale, it, the whole Tri-County region knows about 95 and the traffic on 95. Yeah. Uh, any solutions, anything that you can think of that you want to talk about in terms of how to solve that problem or how we're addressing it? So the good news is there's a lot of really good research out there that shows that when the metro area gets about five and a half, six million people, the car just breaks down. You physically cannot build enough lanes to deal with the traffic flow that comes with having that many people in a region. In the tri-county region, we're at about 6.1 million people, so we're wow. over that threshold. We need some kind of mass transportation, some kind of sub uh, substantial um, investment in, in our mass transportation system. Right now, you can get on a plane at Miami International Airport, fly to Guatemala City, faster than you can get from across Miami-Dade County west to east in public transportation. That's just inexcusable and astonishing. Um, and so finding ways to uh, move people around. And look, you're not going to be able to get everybody out of their car. Sure. The people that live at, in the western part of our region, getting to the eastern part of our region, they're probably going to have to take their car. But what about the folks who live in the urban core and also work and play in the urban core? There's really no reason for households to be two, two, uh, two, family, two car families. And so how can we take those cars off the road to help alleviate the congestion for the people who can't necessarily opt out of those transportation? Sure. I think that's a wonderful thing because we definitely need to help. Not everybody wants to up in Uber all the time. They want to get around the city without having to get in a car. Yeah. It's like, you know, Uber is part of the solution. I know we have Brightline here. We have Tri-Rail here. We also have um, the Metro Mover. I use it all the time downtown yeah. and it's free. Yeah. You know, well, how do you deal with the free issue, the cost issue? Because I've looked at the prices on, um, on Brightline. I've looked at the cost yeah. on, you know, I don't know if it's a very affordable thing for some people. So all this, all these are kind of, so it's going to be kind of an all of the above solution, right? So for you who, who live downtown, the Metro Mover is a great service for you to run. Sure. We could talk about if it's equal that everybody in the county should be paying into a pool and then only you get to use the free service that only extends two yeah, miles. Sure. Definitely some concerns about that, especially because the more affluent folks have tend to live on the eastern side of town. Sure. Um, and kind of get this free amenity while everybody else has to pay for public transportation. Another conversation. That's another day. Um, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I do think that you think about Brightline and, and it, it has a specific niche market, folks who live or work in, in the northern part of our region and, and live or work in the southern part of our region sure. um, and can afford the, 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 the financial burden that comes with 
you know, spending $50 on a commute. It's not everybody, but for the banker that lives in Palm Beaches and, and works in, in Brickell, that is, again, taking their car off the road and helping part of the, pro- uh, part of the solution. But these are not silver bullet things. So we can't just say, oh, Brightline's fixing it. It's going to be fine. Sure. Because the 49% of our economy that relies on service work is not going to pay, uh, be able to afford to pay $50 um, to get to work each day. Yeah, it's a very, very big issue. I mean, there's so many things. And I know you guys out there, you didn't realize you would get so much information today. But there's a lot here, so I want you to dig through it. Um, You know, I've been talking about keeping it moving. You know, I wrote a book about it. I do a workshop, a series about uh, keep it moving and how when things get bad, how you talk about getting through struggle. Personal note, what have you had to get through or adjust to in your life? I won't get to it for this holiday, so let's talk about that. What have you struggled with that you've overcome? Ah, man, that's, uh, wow, okay, it got me a little bit. So I think a lot of what I go through is, like, I, I look very young, and, sure. I, and, I, and I am pretty young. <laughs> um, and I uh, I think it's sometimes people are quick to dismiss or to put you into a box or a category. Um, and quite frankly, I'll, I'll stack my resume up against anybody else. And if you look sure. on paper, I, I feel like I can hang with people. But sometimes when I'm meeting with that funder or I'm meeting with somebody else, it's like, oh, okay, like, who's this kid? Who are they sending? I've gotten confused to... As being the as, as being an intern of my organization that I'm the executive director of, oh wow, it happens all the time. It, it's it's one of those things. It's, it's cool. You work with it, um, but when you start from that deficit framing, sometimes I feel like I have to like press a little bit harder, sure. and I end up making mistakes or errors that I might not otherwise have made if I didn't feel a need to impress people within two minutes. Otherwise, I lose their attention. Type thing. Sure. So I kind of have to come out and like. Um, uh, in the words of Pete Davidson, bring that big something energy sure. uh, uh, out off the bat. Otherwise, um, I feel like I kind of get dismissed sometimes. Well, I know, you know, we're as I can say, you guys, we're going to always have hurdles in life. There are some things that are going to come at you that you may not even expect. The thing is, is as I say all the time, you just keep it moving. You persevere. You just get through crisis in life. And pretty soon they don't become crisis. They become a part of your past. And we're all about the future uh, for now and on this show. Another thing is that I know you about is that you do a lot of networking. I met you at a networking event. How important is that to your business and maybe to our audience? You can just tell them how important it is to, to network and get to know people and work with them. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the world is small, and if we're fortunate, life is long, right? Sure. Um, so we actually met at a mixer right. downtown we did. Miami a couple of months became ago. became really good friends after that. <laughs> Completely different thing. I, I, I uh, serve as a volunteer treasurer for the Black Professionals Network here in South Florida, nonprofit organization looking to close the career gap between uh, professionals of color and, and other folks. Um, and so we met there. I had no idea. If you would have told me two months after that that I was going to be sitting here, I'd be like, oh, that's crazy. Like, like there's no connection sure. um, but relatively small investment relatively like hey this is like, this is like a cool guy I'm gonna invest in them invest in that relationship um, now ultimately kind of results in something else and will continue to result in something else both professionally but also personally I consider you a really good friend now yeah me too um, um, and, so great and, and so I think it's, it's really important to think about not just the short-term transactional transactional relationship but you're investing in something just like you would invest in a business or a client um, you're investing in people wow. and ultimately people change jobs and the world is small and you want to make sure you're making a good impression on people um, I I'd probably go to 10 networking events a week, probably. Wow, so that's another good point to take for them. Networking is very important, guys. You guys need to listen to that. So as I close out, this has been a really good interview, and I hope you guys really get a lot from this. Let's talk about what makes you happy. What do you do? So you guys, you all know, um, we like we have to do things for fun that energize us. I'm going to close this out by asking you, what do you do for fun that makes you really happy? Yeah, this sounds really nerdy, but I just I just really love numbers. So like one of my passion projects over the last couple of years has been uh, tracking all of my transportation spending. So I actually don't. Have oh, that's a car. right. You did tell me about that. I don't. <laughs> ha- I don't have a car. And so you hear so, that, guys? You can live in Florida without a car and get around very well. So that's right? the argument that I'm going to be putting out there. And so I've I've been working on this kind of like longitudinal thing where I'm going to be presenting a lot of information about like kind of how I did it, like what I do, what I see, the gaps, and and kind of. It's not for everybody, but there are ways to do it. And there's also financial benefit in addition to just like the wellness of not having to sit on 95 every day. Sure. Um, so when I think about what I do for fun, like that's been a really fun passion project for a while. Sure. Um, and then I'm, I'm actually also um, in graduate school as well. And so I actually get, I, I find that to be fun as well. Right. It's not, I, I mean, I don't have any 
it's, it's boring but I, for most people <laughs> I, I genuinely derive pleasure from it you know it's so funny that you said that because i remember you know trying to find fun in public transportation and to be that day and you're in florida and it just rains yeah <laughs> when you're headed to a place when it's steamy and it's rainy and it's like what 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 but like you said you know those are things that you're i, I would rather suffer through that than a uh, 600 700 car payment yeah that goes to really just depleting the planet and not adding any value the upshot of my research is basically going to say that i, I estimate that i probably saved somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen thousand dollars without having a car if you use some creative math but. right you know and, and to tell my audience this is so funny that you said that because i always call myself a saver and i'm a really good spender and one of the things that i've done um, this is between us um is that i haven't used the barber in 20 years i spent <laughs> this is not a big savings I spent fifty dollars on a pair of clippers about two, ten years ago. If I thought about all the savings that I made mm. and just not going to a barber, it's like it's huge. It's crazy. It's a really big huge. I so small little things that you can make in your life that can be big savings for you. I think people get stuck in our culture on activities as opposed to outcomes. So like sure. my outcome is is to I want to be able to get from place to place and and as efficiently and as cheaply as possible. And then I kind of work backwards from there and say, okay, what are the activities? What are the steps I need to take to get to that outcome? Sure. As opposed to thinking like, okay. I need the car and I need the certain house and I need that and I need this and then ultimately I'll get to this outcome of happiness. Like I don't think that's a good way to live life and it's sure. kind of, I, I, I attribute a lot of my like personal success uh, to just kind of coming from a place of all right, what is the end game and what are the different paths to get there, working through those paths and then picking one as opposed to just thinking, okay, I have to do this path, I have to do this here. Like if, if you would have told me 10 years ago that I was going to be a philanthropy professional and then run my own think tank, I would have been like, what, what does that even mean? Where do I sure. even start? Like what do I do? But you followed your passion. Exactly. And, and I, your passions led you to where you are today. Absolutely. Following your passions. I love it. I love it. So anyway, guys, Chris, I can't thank you enough. This has been amazing. I've had a really good time. You left some real serious knowledge on my people out there. So I hope you guys listen and learn a lot from this. And um, thank you for watching our show and look forward to the next. So, guys, if you want to learn more or figure out how to get in touch with Chris, let us know. How can they get in touch with you? Absolutely. So we have a website, MiamiUrbanFuture.org. Um, we also have uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everything, at MIA Urban Future. And then my personal handle is at Chris, C-H-R-I-S-O-Canes, C-A-I-N-E-S. Perfect. Chris, thank you so much. That was so much great information. It's almost hard for me to summarize. It was so much good stuff. Guys. Check this out. This is a great, great episode. Share it with your friends because there's so much knowledge here. You can't miss it. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it.